Welcome to Holocaust Remembrance Day at Teachers College. I'm Janice Robinson, Vice President for Diversity and Community Affairs and Associate Professor of Higher Education. Thank you for making the time to join us. We, we gather together today to light candles and to remember the souls of six million Jews and others who were murdered by the Nazi regime, their allies and collaborators. We gather today to remember our, our families, relatives, loved ones, neighbors, friends, and the millions whose lives are forever changed and affected to this day. Today's gathering will begin with a video from the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. We will then hear from several of our colleagues who wish to share remembrances and remarks. It's, it's not easy to share deeply and personally. And I wanna express my profound appreciation uh, for their friendship and for them uh, and for their sharing with us. We could not have done this without them. We will hear first from Dr. Rocky Flint from the Math, Science, and Technology Department. And then from Jim Gardner, our Associate Vice President for External Affairs. And then from Professor Anna Newman from our Higher and Post-Secondary Education Program. And next would be Rena Geld, our own TC doctoral student. And last but not least, Professor Oren Fismoni levy Program Director of the International and Comparative Education after they speak, we will hear and, and the TC choir perform um, with Israeli sign language. So I'm now going to share our video. We will now hear from Dr. Rocky Flint. I join you today with appreciation to our community and the Office of the Vice President of Diversity and Community Affairs, with feeling a respect to all of you who are here, committed to the arduous and essential task of remembering and paying respect to the millions of Jews and millions of other victims who perished in the Holocaust. I am here today as the granddaughter of Sprinza Rechel, and Yaakov Shimon, two courageous Holocaust survivors, and the niece of Sarah and Menachem Meir, my aunt and uncle, whose lives were taken at the tender age of two years old and six months, respectively. Collectively, I lost seven great uncles and aunts, three great grandparents, and many relatives who had a thriving life in pre-war Poland. The Holocaust was hushed about when I was growing up. As children, we would try to understand amongst ourselves and find out what information we could. You see, the older generation didn't want to share. They kept their sorrows to themselves, wishing to shelter us youngsters from the cruelty and inhumanity they experienced. As recently as three weeks ago, I am still learning more stories about their lives and tortured past. Today, I will share a few stories with you about my bubby, which is Yiddish for grandmother, to remember her by. My bubby was from Ludge, Poland. She and her family were put in the Ludge ghetto and then sent to Auschwitz. In Auschwitz, new inmates were sent rechts under links, right to work or left to death by the notorious Nazi Joseph Mengele, also known as the angel of death. Bubby was on line waiting for Mengele to command her fate. She was weak with an infection and knew where she was going to be sent, links to death. The woman in front of her was sent to the right, but as the woman was walking towards right, Mengele noticed sores on the woman's back, a commotion ensued, and she was commanded, links, go left. At that moment, Bubby ducked and ran right, undetected. This story we know from my Bubby, because she lived in constant pain and would cry because of this woman's ill fate to the gas chambers gave my Bubby a chance at life. 
she felt that she had to live for this woman as well. Bubby had another miracle. Later, when she was listed to be sent to the gas chambers, the liberating troops came at that time. Once liberation was fi finalized, Bubby went around searching for her husband, Yaakov Shimon. There were lists all over Germany and parts of Europe with names of survivors. As loved ones were scrambling to find those who survived, my Bubby heard that her husband's list was on, her name was on a list. After many attempts, she finally located him at a hospital. A couple both surviving the concentration camps was quiet rear. My Bubby was reunited with my Zadie, a happy ending of sorts. She was over 40 years of age, her body weak, but she forged on to rebuild a family. After losing her two children in the ghetto, she gave birth to two more children, a daughter, my aunt Esther Malka, named after Bubby's mother, and a son, my dear, dear father, Avram Michal, after Bubby's father, who both were murdered in the Holocaust. This is a photo of them. All my life, Bubby was a phenomenal baker. She had the ability to make everything scrumptious. So I was not surprised to learn growing up that in Auschwitz, Bubby was given the job as a baker. What I found out very recently was that Bubby would sneak raw dough and store it in her underarms. And that is how she sustained her weak malnourished body with this raw dough. Bubby never shared this part with us. Last summer, the Office of Diversity and Community Affairs had a TC cook-off. I was privileged to share Bubby's challah recipe. Her talent with baking and cooking was something I was privileged to be nourished with all my childhood. I was honored to be raised by this Bubby who just moved forward from the darkness to nurture and build a new life full of light. With the grace of God, Bubby survived. Through her son and daughter, she is the matriarch of close to 100 offspring. This is one story of over 6 million. I light this candle in honor of my Bubby, in honor of all my relatives, in honor of all those who perished, in honor of our humanity, and in honor of their legacy that we are remembering today. I light this candle so we dispel the darkness of evil with our communal light. May we all do acts of goodness and kindness to ensure goodness forever overpowers the forces of evil. May all those who perish be always remembered. The following song, entitled Ani Mamin, which is Hebrew for I Believe, was composed by Cantor and Azriel David Fastag on the train to the Treblinka extermination camp. The song embodies the relentless Jewish faith in the coming of the Messiah and the Messianic age of peace and, and harmony. This song is sung by my Rebbe, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, Rabbi Menachem Mendel Schneerson, who was pivotal in rebuilding Jewish life post-war. My Bubby found immense strength in the presence and teachings of the Rebbe. <laughs> Thank you for, sh for, for sharing, for sharing that uh, the very, very moving story. In some ways, words often fail me after 
after hearing and hearing hearing this this kind of this this story and many many stories like this. Um, I'm going to share two poems, uh, but my one reflection, which I wanted to share with everyone, and what I've grown up with in the shadow of the of the Holocaust has been the lesson that the moment that any of us denies the humanity of a fellow human being, if we are, if we say nothing or do nothing in the face of an injustice against another human being, we land on the spectrum of inhumanity that ends in the death camps, that ends in genocide. The two poems that I'd like to, that I would like to share with you are from two of my favorite writers. The first one was from a Holocaust survivor, a survivor of Auschwitz, a great Italian writer, novelist, essayist, and poet, uh, Primo Levi. This is the Shema. You who live secure in your warm houses, who return at evening to find hot food and friendly faces, consider whether this is a man who labors in the mud, who knows no peace, who fights for a crust of bread, who dies at a yes or a no. Consider whether this is a woman without hair or name, with no more strength to remember, eyes empty and womb cold as a frog in winter. Consider, consider that this has been. I commend these words to you. Engrave them on your hearts when you are in your house, when you walk on your way, when you go to bed, when you rise, repeat them to your children or may your house crumble, disease re render you powerless, your offspring avert their faces from you. The second poem that I'm going to read is from uh, a great Israeli poet, Yehuda Amichai. Amichai. This is called After Auschwitz. After Auschwitz, no theology. From the chimneys of the Vatican, white smoke rises, a sign the cardinals have chosen themselves a pope. From the crematoria of Auschwitz, black smoke rises, a sign the conclave of gods has not yet chosen the chosen people. After Auschwitz, no theology. The numbers on the forearms of the inmates of extermination are the telephone numbers of God, numbers that do not answer and now are disconnected one by one. After Auschwitz, a new theology. The Jews who died in the Shoah have now come to be like their God, who has no likeness of a body and has no body. They have no likeness of a body and they have no body. May the memory of the six million be for a blessing always. Thank you. Professor Anna Newman. Thank you, everybody. This life I lead. I am my parents' wildest dream. I am the hope in their eyes. I cannot speak just of them apart from myself. I grow from their lives. I exist because of what they lost. I am here today only because the unthinkable came to be. Growing up in the far eastern corner of Czechoslovakia, in the town of Poreshov, my father Menachem Dov, Emmanuel, was a happy and rambunctious child. He joked and shared his witticisms with friends. He played the game he liked to call soccer football, but only when his father wasn't looking. Uh, he dreamt that one day he would open a store. He deeply loved his parents, Hannah and Chaim Moshe, his three brothers and four sisters and their babies, eight of them by 1939. Between 1940 and 1945, every shred of his life and of his mind came undone. Two brothers 
had earlier immigrated to the US and yes, they would be fine. The others one by one were shipped in cattle cars to Nazi killing centers. Two sisters with their husbands and the eight babies were murdered barbarically by villagers before the Nazis arrived. And my father, my father was interned in Auschwitz and in maybe six satellite concentration camps. He was in Buchenwald two times. He was forced on three death marches. On April 23rd, 1945, he was liberated by the US Army. A 36 year old man weighing 79 pounds he was hospitalized for more than a year. He returned to Czechoslovakia, hoping that a relative had survived and would make their way home. No one else returned. My mother, my mother Yehudit Burer was born and spent her childhood with Chaya and Abraham, her parents and Mordechai and Yaakov, her brothers, in the Jewish sector of Suchava, a culturally and religiously rich site of Jewish life in the Romanian province of Bukovina. She loved to help her father with his grain business and at a young age fell deep into her studies of European literature and languages and of mathematics which she utterly loved. I imagined her life as cast between two worlds. Her great grandfather descending from a family of mystics and scholars who studied the Zohar, the Jewish book of splendor had been forced through hard economic times to become a merchant. Yehudit studies her very childhood jolted to a stop when in her eighth grade year, she, like all Jewish Romanian students, were forced to leave school. A short time later in 1941, the Jews of Suchava, my mother and her family among them, were shipped by cattle car to Bessarabia. And from there, they were put on a death march, one that claimed the lives of 90% of the 150,000 Jews deported from Bukovina to a labor camp in the Ukrainian territory of Transnistria. In Ukraina, as my mother called it, she, her parents, and the two boys shared a tiny room. She slept on the stove, braving the frigid cold with little to eat, forced to labor daily in surrounding fields. She was denied medical treatment, left to die, as she said, for months after contracting typhus. And on the slow return to Romania at the war's end, she foiled a band of drunken Russian soldiers intent on raping her. I share these fragments of my parents' lives to make a few points that while I knew my parents deeply and in ways that their very well-meaning American friends could not, uh, neither could I ever truly discern the horrors that deep in their lives they had once faced. What they saw and heard and knew and what they felt in ways that words could not capture nor could I know as deeply as they could how they lived with memory of terror, fear, and loss, even as they found themselves in safer times and safer sites, as the world slowly seemed to right itself. But they were never sure it had, even in their post-war lives. In observing Yom HaShoah, I recall not only the cruelty and violence that invaded their lives, but also how in, in my parents' memories, 
that savagery alongside their fears that it could reappear at any time lived on. How memory entwined with every fiber of my parents' post-Holocaust lives. And also how I too, though standing so distant from what they knew and endured, continue to feel and breathe the memory of those horrors. The Holocaust was perhaps a product of its time. As an event, it came to an end. In memory and in human connection, its brutality continues. May we see an end to hate. May we reach only for goodness. May we, as teachers, shape our students' learning and our own only in this light. Thank you, Anna. We will now hear from Rena Gill. My maternal and paternal grandparents were fortunate enough to immigrate to the United States before the onset of World War II, during which many of the remaining family members in their hometowns in Czechoslovakia and Poland were murdered by the Nazis. Of my maternal grandfather's family, including seven siblings and his parents, only my grandfather Isaac and his brother Joshua escaped being murdered by Nazis in the Holocaust. The story of how my great uncle Joshua evaded the Holocaust is recorded in his memoir, which I would like to partly share with you. The memoir tells how at the age of 17, Joshua found himself in Soviet occupied Poland, while the remainder of his immediate family remained in their home in Nazi occupied Poland. For refusing to accept Soviet citizenship, Joshua was branded an enemy of the Soviets and deported on a many months long journey by a cattle car, boat, and foot to a forced labor camp in Siberia. In Siberia, the daily temperatures in winter were 75 degrees below zero and prisoners were given a starvation diet. One year later, when the Nazis invaded Russia and the Polish army fought by the Soviet side, the Soviet authorities freed all the Polish prisoners. However, this was of little help to the residents of the camp, since there was no transportation from the camp to the nearest city, 1,120 miles away, except at exorbitant prices. While Joshua had managed to survive that first year, the question of how he would rejoin free society and reunite with his family was utmost in his mind. Against the advice of all his friends in the camp and risking his life, Joshua made the decision to travel the 1,120 miles through the Siberian wasteland wilderness alone by foot. On that journey, he struggled with questions of the fate of his family and existential questions of the potential for good in humanity. Ultimately, Joshua completed his journey and arrived in the city and later in Moscow. He then made it out of the Soviet Union onto Cuba and with the help of my grandfather, eventually to the United States. He went on to marry, have two children, and many grandchildren. When I read the story of Joshua, I was inspired by his resilience, courage, fortitude, will, and hope. 
Joshua's story is only one example among the survivors who built or rebuilt their families and the many murdered. Their bravery and courage are a legacy for all of us. Professor Aaron Pismoni Levy. Thank you, Janice, and your team for hosting this event. I must admit that sitting by myself in the office, um, listening to everybody and watching the short clip was really overwhelming. Uh, Holocaust, or in the world in Hebrew, Shoah, is such an unbelievable. Um, low point in the history of civilization. And I, there, there is little one can say about how overwhelming this is, but today in my contribution to this event, I want to share with you maybe a story of hope. Um, growing up in Israel, you hear a lot about Shoah through the formal education system and through the uh, National Remembrance Day that happened in Israel yesterday and today. But I never saw the link between that story and me, the direct link, because in my family we didn't talk about what happened during the, these years. And I think only going up and maybe moving to the US and being a religious minority again, not again, being a, a religious minority here, I started asking more questions. And that's where I realized that my family uh, experienced the Holocaust just in a little bit different story than what we heard so far. So the story goes that my mother uh, was born during the uh, during the war in 1942 in uh, Sofia, Bulgaria. And luckily, the Bulgarian Jews, a Jewish community, 50,000 people, were saved by a decision of the king and the intellectual elite in Bulgaria that pushed against the will of the Nazis who occupied Bulgaria um, early in the 40s. So the king and, and the elite really pushed back and protected the Jews within the territory of Bulgaria. They didn't do that for Jews in the occupied territories that Bulgaria had in Greece and other places in the Mediterranean. And that's how 50,000 Jews were saved. They just pushed them to the northern part of the country, protected them from the Nazis. And only when Noach and I took my mother a couple of years ago to Bulgaria for the first time. That was the moment when I realized that I'm part of this story, that I, I'm here because a group of people decided to fight against the Nazis in Bulgaria and to protect my family and, 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 and to allow my grandmother and grandfather um, a safe place where they can raise my mother and later on my uncle and everybody in 48 moved to Israel. So I want to share with you a couple of pictures from this trip that for me, really for the first time, helped me to understand that I'm part of this awful story, but it's, it's a story, in, in, in our case, it's a story of hope. So I'm going to share with you four pictures from that story and I'll give you some more context. So, uh, can everybody see my pictures? So, Janice, are we good? Can, can we see? Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank so, you. In, in this picture, you see my beautiful mother uh, standing on the corner of uh, Ezra Yosef Street. That's where she was born. She never visited Bulgaria since they left in 48. This was the first time she did it with us, with Noach and I, and it was uh, three years ago. My mother was born in 42 and 43 is when the Jews were pushed to the northern part of Bulgaria. When I'm thinking about that, my mother and her family lost everything they had, everything. 
and had to escape to an area that they didn't have um, nothing there. Uh, my grandfather, uh, my great grandfather, uh, used to be in the merchandise industry. They lost everything: the business, the, the house. Uh, they had a little bit of uh, um, stuff that they took with them. And I'm thinking about my mother. My mother was younger than what Barak is today. And I can't imagine going through this. So we went together with my mother to visit that neighborhood and went to the big main synagogue of the Jewish community uh, in Sofia. A beautiful, gorgeous building. And inside, I'll show you a picture. This is a picture from the inside. Um, and I closed my eyes for a second. That's my mother and Noah. And I closed my eyes for a second and I was able to imagine my uh, grandmother getting married there. I was able to think about other events from the family that happened in that amazing community. And then when I opened my eyes, I saw this image, a yellow star of David in, from glass, you know, at the ceiling of the synagogue. And I, th that was the moment that I just started crying realizing that I'm part of this. And a yellow star of David was something that the community did 200 years ago to celebrate themselves. And what happened in the war is that this symbol became such an evil sign. And that's the thing that I'm, I'm really taking from here that um, we have to talk about this and we have to, um, we have to share more and more and we, and, and we need to ask more questions about this and we have to make sure that it will never happen again. Not only for the Jews. There are many other groups that are suffering from hate and we just have to stop this. Um, and I'll stop here. Thank you, everybody. I'm lighting the candle in my office, um, thinking about all the victims of the Holocaust, uh, Jews, nomad people, uh, homosexuals, uh, and others that, um, the victims of this awful event. Thank you again, everyone, for the stories um, about your families. And, and I want to thank you again for coming forward and sharing um, with us. Next, we will have uh, the TC Choir perform. They're performing Al Shoshoa and with Israeli sign language. And the Hebrew text means the world is sustained by three things, by truth, by justice, and by peace. And the TC Choir is led by Dr. Nicole Becker. And the TC Choir is one of our pride and joys at the college, and they truly demonstrate the unity of Teachers College.
this is a village. We never could do this alone. So it's important to say a very public thank you to Robbie Berry um, and Joshua and uh, for the captioning and the support for uh, Kathy Santana, Juan Carlos Reyes, uh, Melissa Rooker, um, Rudy, I know you're there somewhere, um, could not do this without you. And of course, Rocky and Jim and Anna and Rena and Oren. Well, I am going to say thank you and that we will never forget. <laughs>